Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for our Power Podcast live streaming series. This has been a historic streaming series already. I mean, we've had the best of the best, and we're just getting started. I mean, we're really getting ready to pour some more fuel on the fire, if you will. So my name is Brother Bedford, just in case you do not know that. I am the founder of the Masters of Business Network and Mastermind. That idea came to me from following my mentor, who you're going to hear from in just a few moments, Dr. George C. Frazier. And so with that said, what I want to do is take a couple housekeeping things because we want to be respectful of your time. So if you can see us, if you can hear us, just go ahead and type in the bottom that you can see us, you can hear us, tell us where you're from, and I'll go back over and take a look at those uh, where you're from and who's on here and all of those things. But more importantly, as you're doing that, I want you to hit the follow button. I want you to hit the love button. I want you to hit the like button, but I want you to share this. Invite your family, invite your friends. Let's get this message out to as many of our people as we possibly can, because we know that we are in a critical time period and we need critical, timely information. And that's what we're bringing you tonight with Anthony Browder. So with that said, I'm going to get ready to turn it over to my mentor. I just want to make sure that everyone is putting it in there. I think Linda's putting in some questions. And if you have some questions, go ahead and type them in the bottom, just where you entered in, where you're from. Make sure you continue to hit the share and the like button. Uh, please share your comments. We don't censor anyone. So go ahead and put your comments in the bottom, whether you agree or disagree. We want to hear from you, okay? So make sure you're sharing. Now, what I want to do now, as we get ready to go into the rest of the program is to bring before you the gentleman who has been my mentor for the past, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, he started his company with his partner over 32 years ago. It was FraserNet Inc. It has more, it's still FraserNet Inc., but it's more from a networking and economic development movement into now a full-blown nation that stretches across the entire globe. Now, he is without question considered Black America's number one power broker. That came from Upscale Magazine, and he was also on the cover of Black Enterprise as Black America's number one networker. I can't think of too many people who are successful in Black America who have not had some interaction and leaned on Dr. Frazier for some type of assistance, guidance, mentoring, or tutelage. It just doesn't exist. Everybody that I've talked to, they know Dr. George C. Frazier. Without further delay, I want to introduce to some, but of course, just acquaint you back to your brother and friend, my brother and friend, Dr. George C. Frazier. Thank you, Brother Bedford. And um, this is a special day for me. I, I can't tell you how excited I am. The small hairs on the back of my neck are rising. We have with us uh, tonight an anointed human being, a very, very special human being, uh, a human being that God has given a powerful and unique assignment to and he has honored that assignment for it, almost four decades. Um, he is a longtime friend. I discovered him when a very close friend, Dr. Asa Hilliard, passed away in 2007. Asa Hilliard, when we started our Power Networking Conference back in 2002, we brought Asa Hilliard on the first year and every year until his death to talk us through our ancient heritage. And of course, he was extraordinary. What I didn't know at the time was that he was mentoring a young man named Tony Browder. And I discovered Tony Browder after Ace's death. There was a little gap. We were all saddened. I was really shaken. It was a small gap. And then someone introduced me to Anthony Browder. We talked and um, boy, apples don't fall too far from the tree. You talk about coaching and mentoring uh, Dr. Asa Hill, you did one hell of a job. So much so that Anthony Browder, I believe has risen to the top of the world as one of the most important Egyptologists in the world 
and certainly one of the most important black Egyptologists from an African-centric uh, centric perspective. Um, we have done several trips with Anthony Browda. We try to have an annual trip with this genius. Uh, if you ever go to Egypt, uh, you actually really need to, <laughs> to be under the tutelage of Anthony Browder. There's just no one on the planet that does it like him. Um, he has a very beautiful bio. I, I want to do him some justice by just sort of reading a couple of things from his bio that I did not memorize, but you need to know. Uh, Anthony T. Browder is the author, publisher, and cultural historian, artist, and he is an educational consultant. He's a graduate of Howard University and has lectured extensively throughout the United States and five continents. Mr. Brown is the founder and director of the IKG Cultural Resources and has devoted 35 years of research and researching ancient Egyptian history, science, philosophy, and culture. He has traveled to Egypt 52 times since 1980. And he is currently the director of the Asa Restoration Project, which he named in honor of his mentor, Asa Hilliard. Uh, this project is funding uh, the excavation and the restoration of two 25th century dynasty tombs of Kushite noblemen on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt. Tony is the first African-American to fund and coordinate an archeological dig in Egypt and has led 20 archeological missions to Egypt since 2009. Tony's three decades of study has led him to the conclusion that ancient Africans were the architects of civilization and developed the rudiments of what has become the scientific, religious, and philosophical backbone of mankind. He is from, uh, it is from this framework that IKG has concentrated its research and disseminated its findings. He is the author of six publications, including bestsellers from the Browder File, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, and Egypt on the Potomac, and he co-authored uh, 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 for his publications, including uh, two written with his daughter, Atlantis, uh, Ty Browder. Uh, uh, his daughter, uh, Mrs. Browder, has accompanied her father on six excavation missions in Egypt, and they are the first African-American father and daughter archaeological team in the history of the universe. Anthony is currently pursuing a degree in Egyptology at the University of Manchester, England, and is an adjunct professor of Africana Studies at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. All of Mr. Browder's publications um, are currently used in classrooms around the world. His publication names are, and I want to, I want to, I want to give you these these credits: uh, Egypt on the Potomac, Survival Strategies for Africans in America. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, The Browder File, 22 Essays on the African-American Experience from the Browder File series, Finding Karakamun, uh, The Collaborative Rediscovery of a Lost Tomb, and finally, Avatar, A Historical and Cultural Analysis. <clears throat> analysis. Now, we are going to unpack uh, tonight uh, with the time that we have um, survival strategies for Africans in America, 13 Steps to Freedom. These su survival strategies are part of the core values, the core lessons, the core direction that we have baked into with the help of Dr. Kwa David Whitaker, we have baked into the preamble, the, con uh, the Declaration of Interdependence and our Constitution. We have stolen, not really stolen, 
but we have borrowed heavily from the mind of this great thinker. Survival for uh, survival strategies for African uh, Africans in America was written specifically, and I'm now reading Tony's words, to help recovering Negroes, I love that, and former black people to become born again uh, Africans, all right? It consists of useful information when dutifully applied will allow us the invisible bonds uh, to, to get rid of the, to break free of the invisible bonds of oppression designed to stymie our mental, physical, and spiritual development and to prevent us from becoming, becoming self-determining people. This is, what is so fascinating about Anthony Browder and why his books sell so well is he has the ability to take, let's say, complicated information and put it in useful, learnable, repeatable, inspiring, and aspiring terms. He can not only write that way, he speaks that way. And the presentation that he gives at the beginning of the Power Networking Conference on opening morning, each and has each year for many years, uh, is testimony to how effective he is not only as an Egyptologist, archeologist, writer, but also effective as a powerful and inspiring speaker. So uh, without further ado, I know that's a long introduction, but uh, out of respect uh, and out of recognition, Tony, from the incredible work that you have committed your life to, I just had to do that. Um, and I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy evening on Saturday to be with us. And uh, you look as handsome as ever. I love that outfit. You're, I don't know where you, you probably get your outfit somewhere in Africa, but you're always Ghana. Ghana. Right. Right. In Ghana? Yes, sir. No. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, the book, Survival Strategies for Africans in America 13 Steps to Freedom. Now, we're not going to have time to unpack completely. Uh, every detail of the step. So we're going to suggest that you go on Amazon or should they go to your website? Tom? They should go to my website. It's all right to patronize white folk if black folk don't have the product, but all of my books are, are published by our company and are available on our website at oh. ikg-info.com. Okay, say it again. ikg-info.com. Okay, all right. You'll want to pick up a copy of this book when, when this lecture, if you will, these lessons are, are finished. He broke this down into four categories that we're all familiar with, mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and spirit. Yeah, mind, three, three categories, mind, body, and spirit. And each uh, under each category, and I'm going to begin with the mind, he has uh, steps one through five. I'm going to sort of read the step and then I'm going to ask uh, Tony Browder to unpack the essence of what he wants us to understand relative to that step. And I'm just going to go through the 13 steps in that way. Uh, this is his area of expertise. He has spent his life on unpacking these thoughts and ideas. Um, and so uh, we're just gonna let Tony talk tonight. Um, step one on beginning with the mind. You have here, Tony, racism and white supremacy are the most persistent problems confronting Africans in America. We had Boyce Watkins on uh, I think it was Tuesday, or it might have been Thursday. Thursday. Boyce Watkins said something very, very interesting. He said that Black people are addicted to white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That in many respects, we love and respect white people more than we love and respect and trust ourselves. I thought that was a very provocative statement. But you address it right here. Racism and white supremacy are the most persistent problems confronting Africans in America. Can you unpack that for us? 
Sure. Uh, I'd like to reference a quote from uh, Neely Fuller, who was a teacher for the late uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. And Dr. Fuller uh, said in his publication that if you don't understand the nature of white supremacy and how it shows up in your life, then mm -hmm. everything that you think you understand will only confuse you. So mm -hmm. the reality is uh, racism and white supremacy are so ubiquitous that we accept it as a natural state of being, when in fact, it has always been a nat an unnatural state of being because there's no race that is superior to another race. It's, right. a, it's a false construct. And so the first thing that we have to do is understand who created that false construct and how it shows up in our lives so that we can begin to remove its presence within from our consciousness. It's the same thing that Dr. Carter G. Woodson <clears throat> referenced in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, when he said, uh, when someone controls your thinking, uh, you don't, they can tell you where to stand. Um, they will order you to the, go to the back door of any society. And if there is no back door, you will create one for your special purposes. Miseducation is white supremacy. Miseducation is racism. So these, these forces exist, they're very real, and we need to confront them head on. And once we do, we can begin to understand the power that we as African people have always had and the powerlessness that our oppressor has. And the only way that they can control us is by controlling our minds. If we believe in their superiority and our inherent inferiority, then we will continue to give our power to them. So let, me, let me just make um, uh, one, one, one comment to, to frame our discussion. Um, as you were speaking, um, introducing me, I, I thought about um, a speaking engagement I did back in 1991 during Black History Month. Um, I went to speak at a government agency in Washington, D.C., and it wasn't until I got to that facility that I discovered that it was the CIA. It was a branch of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And of course, the brothers who had invited me, the brothers and sisters who had invited me said, well, yeah, Black folk work for the CIA too. Well, they brought me in to, to do my you know, typical Black History Month presentation. And the director of the facility was supposed to introduce me, but he was at a meeting in Langley. And, and they were going to start the program, uh, but if he came in, he was going to take over. So the program started, they had uh, uh, a school choir, they had some other activities. And then I noticed as I'm sitting about to go up, I noticed uh, the people around me starting to sit up straight in their chairs. And I look back in the back and I saw this small Peter Lorre looking white guy he had just come in the door and, and everyone responded to him. And I said, he must be the director of the facility. So I watched the young lady who was the MC of the program speak to him very briefly. And he then proceeded to walk down the aisle. He came to the stage, stepped to the podium and proceeded to introduce me by giving the audience my bio, the, similar to the introduction that you gave, but he had committed it all to memory. And he recited my, my, my bio, my introduction, which is about maybe four or five paragraphs verbatim, with the exception of the last line. The last line states, uh, Tony Browder has dedicated his, his life to the positive portrayal of the worldwide African experience. This man said, Tony Browder is in the same business that, that we're in. The only difference is he gathers intelligence relative to the positive portrayal of the worldwide African experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Browder. I came up, did the presentation, and when I returned home, that evening I was thinking about that introduction. I was thinking where I was. I'm at the Central Intelligence Agency, the greatest spy agency in the world, and their job is to gather intelligence from all over the world, to feed that data to uh, persons whose job it is to analyze this information and then feed it down the chain to those with the need to know who will then determine how that information is going to be used in order to ensure the development and the safety of an organization, a business, or a nation. So from that point on, 1991, I began to look at my work differently. That yes, my job is to gather intelligence about the worldwide African experience, to, to analyze that data, and then to make it accessible to those with the greatest need to know so that they can utilize this knowledge now to enhance the quality of their lives. And so Asa Hilliard wrote the introduction to my first book from the Browder file. 
And based on the response to that book, uh, I saw a need to give people practical information on how to apply this new knowledge in their lives mm -hmm. in survival strategies for Africans in America, 13 Steps to Freedom. And the first step that we must acknowledge is the ubiquitousness of racism and white supremacy. We must deconstruct that false narrative and begin to understand who we are as African people, the first human beings on the planet. We have the longest history of historical and cultural accomplishments longer than any other people. So all we need to do is to know ourselves, tap into that knowledge, and we can minimize most problems before they even show up on our doorstep. So this book, Survival Strategies, is probably more significant now in 2020 than it was when I wrote it in 1996, because we are faced with uh, enhanced levels of racism and white supremacy. And evidence of that has just come to the fore this week when it was announced that African-Americans in Chicago and Detroit and Philadelphia and uh, New Orleans are dying of COVID-19 at higher rates than any other segment of the population. Mm -hmm. Part of that is due to racial disparities in our healthcare. But as we talk about in the, the segment in the book that deals with the body, we have a responsibility to take care of what we put into our bodies, which will mitigate our uh, susceptibility to COVID-19 or the flu or heart attack or diabetes. We control those things. And when we accept responsibility for how we think, how we eat, and what we do, we will change the dynamic overnight. Yes. Wow. Um, step two. You say here, become aware of the power of the media. Yes, uh, and that's particularly a poignant uh, statement uh, considering the current occupant of the White House who's been um, railing on about uh, the, the false media, right? The false media. Yeah, yeah. fake with, news. The fake news. We've been dealing with fake news for 400 years. <laughs> right. This is nothing new. Right? Uh, all too often when we watch the news, the main narrative in the news bureaus is if it bleeds, it leads. And so we always see the worst of us on the news. And very rarely do we hear of the many positive things that are happening in our environment. So we have to become aware of the fact that the media is the most powerful form of mental manipulation ever created. And African Americans consume more media content than any other people on the planet. We put the social in social media. <laughs> we understand uh, how powerful this form of mass communication is, then we can use this as tools to facilitate our own uh, mental, psychological, emotional, and spiritual liberation. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the World Wide Web, social media, having access uh, to this handheld computer because that's really what it is a, a phone is a misnomer has it helped us or hurt us uh, a little bit of both um i hmm. sometimes refer to the information superhighway as the information stupid highway because there's a lot of of just insane information out there um, and we see all too often someone reads a book and all of a sudden they're an authority in something on something that they know nothing about so to that extent, it's harmed us, us considerably because there's too many people out, out there uh, on social media putting information out that is just flat wrong. And so many of our people are being led down a dead end following people who don't know what they're talking about, but they're talking about it very well. So we, we, we um, are easily misled and easily confused. So we have to begin to understand how powerful this tool is and train people to use these tools properly such that they will facilitate our liberation. Yeah, yeah, and monitor the amount of time and we spend a disproportionate amount of time on that thing. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. We, and, we, and it's also been known for, for decades that African-Americans watch more television than any segment of the US population. And we have a tendency to believe what we see on television. Yes. So uh, one of the things that I've been encouraging people to do is to develop a, a new formula for empowerment. 
for every hour you spend watching television or on social media, you should spend two hours reading or studying. And if right. we can begin to, to make that equation a part of our living experiences, then we can see uh, profound changes within um, our communities uh, within, within a matter of months. Yeah. Um, yeah, A.C. Nielsen did a major report on that, and, uh, and they rated the television viewing habits by cultural group and African Americans. Uh, it was determined statistically that we watch 40% more television than any cultural group in the history of the world. On average, we watch 10 hours of television a day. Mm -hmm. 10 hours of television a day. Any Negro watching 10 hours of television a day needs their ass kicked, all right? So that's a whole nother story. I don't know how many hours a day we also spend on this, and it may be divided now, but it's still 10 hours of television staring at something that unless you're using it to empower you and to change uh, the information, the negative information about our people, much of it is a waste of time. You know, uh, number George, the segment that watches, the segment of the U.S. population that watches television the least is the Asian. Yes. We see where they are. We yes. see what they're doing with their That's time. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Number three, step three in mind, in the section on the mind. Perception precedes being. You are who you believe you are. Absolutely. Yes. Belief is something that you accept without proof. And if someone tells you that you are inferior, you are less than, that you are incapable of doing X, Y, and Z, and you believe that, then you will fulfill that negative self-fulfilling prophecy. And so it's important to understand, to, to broaden your perception, to know who you are. That's why history is so important. Yes. When we understand what our ancestors have done, as, as one of my teachers, John Henry Clark, often said, over half of human history was over before the first European lived in a house or wore a shoe. <laughs> this is real. And right. if we dove into the aspect of, of our ancestral legacy that is documented, it would change our perception of who we are and how we got where we are and our ability to assume total responsibility for changing the circumstances that will allow us to determine where we and our descendants will go in the future. That's the importance of, of controlling your mind. And you mm -hmm. do that by learning, by knowing yourself, learning to love yourself, and then protecting your greatest asset, which is your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, step four, information is power. But power is nothing without control. Unpack that. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think cool. that statement speaks for itself. Uh, yes. we, we, we spend too much time consuming information, but how much of that information are we actually producing ourselves? Yeah, right. How much of that research are we making available to our people? So it's about controlling the information that comes into your household and controlling the dissemination of that information into, into the households of those you love, and then being able to accurately uh, charter and control where people go as a result of you having given them information that affirms their humanity and the power within. That's what I mean by control. Sure, sure. And, and, and constantly filtering uh, what you're taking in uh, and I, I believe in monitoring what our children see and read. Um, yeah. So uh, step five, empower your mind and see the world through African eyes. So I know uh, some of this stuff speaks for itself. I know. But, but um, you know, if there's some additional thoughts you want to add to it, that would, would be helpful. Well, we have to understand why we've been socialized to disparage Africa. We have to begin to understand why during the 1950s and, and 60s, for example, um, Negroes would get upset if you call them African mm -hmm. because of the negative perceptions of Africa that have been implanted within our minds by racist and white supremacist 
society. So if we study African history, uh, again, going back to Dr. Clark's quote, quote, over half of human history was over before there was civilization in Europe. We could spend the rest of our lives studying the greatness that African people have produced. And, and that will inspire us to spend the rest of our lives attempting to replicate what our ancestors have done. Because the beauty of knowing your history, the beauty of understanding your ancestors is the fact that what they have done, you have the capacity to do. Amen, amen. Um, I picked up something about four or five years ago, I thought was a powerful, and you may have seen this, and this is the Holy Bible, the African-American version of the Holy Bible. Yes. Right? Yes. It is, yes. Have you seen it? I've seen it. I have a copy. Yes, I have a copy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, again, as you look through the pictures, what you see is yourself. You see Jesus as a black man. I mean, it, it is, I mean, it is the King James Version, right. but, but it is illustrated in beautiful African art, beautiful, uh, has, uh, you know, uh, African written gospel songs and, and all of the rest of the stuff. But it's a small thing, but it's a, a significant thing because, uh, we, you know, I think we're very heavy into the Bible. As, yes, as, we are. So if you're going to read the Bible, why not read the Bible uh, that at least the pictures right speak to you? Also in this Bible, uh, it is outlined in the Bible or highlighted in the Bible every place a person of African descent is mentioned. Yes. Right. So relevant to the stories. And I know you've got a whole thing on that, but 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 it, it beats a sharp stick in the eye. That's all I'm saying. Right. Well, let, let me say two things about that. One, Egypt and Ethiopia are mentioned more in the Bible than any other country. Right. That book is a book about African people. Uh, one interesting backstory about that particular Bible is that uh, one of my colleagues and, and, and frat brothers, uh, Dr. Kane Hope Felder, who, who just passed last year, a brilliant scholar, taught at Howard's Divinity School, was a consultant for that publication. That's right, yeah. He's, and, he's and prominently I, mentioned in here. And I would I constantly run into Dr. Felder um, in, in Giza. I was bringing my troops, to, my groups to Egypt. He was bringing his, his groups from the Holy Land uh, and coming to Egypt. And, and I would say, Dr. Felder, it's good to see you. Uh, have you been to Luxor yet? No, 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 we just, we just visit Cairo and then we go back home. And I say, Dr. Felder, until you go to Luxor, you have not been to Egypt. And I've had this conversation with them three or four times before I ran into him in a hotel in, in, in Detroit several years later. And he came up to me and said, Brother Browder, I finally went to Luxor. And now I understand what you're talking right, about. Right, right. Now I understand. Yes. So, you know, even even the best and the brightest among us uh, can still learn. Oh no, no, yeah, no, no question, no question. So we covered the, the the steps, the five steps in in dealing with, with the survival strategies as it relates to our mind, and you know, as a man thinketh, so is he. We're going to move on to body. Step six: become aware of the uniqueness of your African body. On, speak to that. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> there's a phrase that I'm sure all of us have heard, but we may not have really thought about the significance of that. There's a term that's generally used to describe someone who's in good health, and that term is in the pink, right? Black people can never be in the pink, right? So the, the issue with health care, health care is predicated upon using, um, for the most part, for the first hundred or so years of organized health care, the white male was the model for all healthcare. Mm -hmm. And everyone else was attended to based on the data that doctors and, and scientists had accrued, accrued as a result of studying white men. Well, we're not all the same. African bodies are profoundly different mm -hmm. from European bodies. And so if we are going to uh, subject ourselves to a European-centered healthcare system, then yeah. we need to understand the uniqueness of our bodies and insist when we go to the doctor that they look for things that are specific to African people and not examine us based on the European model. 
So what, what I've learned over time in, uh, in my trips to, to visit doctors and taking my mother and grandmother to the doctors when they were ill, if you don't advocate for your own health, you will not be respected by the healthcare professional. And the more you know about your body, the more you read up about your illness and come and have intelligent discussions with them, the more they will respect you and give you the care that you deserve. Right. You, you, you say in step seven, develop cultural and holistic approaches to health. Can you give some examples of that? Sure. Well, <clears throat> we know that, for example, um, in, in step nine, I, I, I make reference to melanin, but melanin is a important component to our physical and emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. you, will never, you will never receive any of this information from the white press or the white medical association. There are certain foods that people of African ancestry should not eat. Uh, we, we know that, that most people of African ancestry are lactose intolerant. That's so true. we should not be drinking a milk. We should not, we should stay away from dairy because we can't process it. And mm -hmm. much of the asthma uh, that the African American community has is a result of us consuming foods that our bodies are not designed mm -hmm. to process. Black people are not white people. Our bodies developed in a different environment. Our bodies respond to different foods. We respond right. to the environment differently than others. So know yourself. And once you know yourself and adapt uh, certain diets that, that uh, enhance the quality of our melanated bodies, that allows you to live a healthier quality of life. Yeah, there are a lot more African-Americans um, now uh, partaking in veganism. Are you, are you a vegan? No, I'm a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for 45 years. Okay. Um, and, and that came about as a result of my beginning to associate more with vegetarians, reading uh, Dick Gregory's book on vegetarianism, reading right. what was at that time, the, the Bible of vegetarianism, a book called Back to Eden by Jeff Lukos. And what I read just made sense. Uh, our bodies, the human body, uh, technically is not designed to process meat because we have a long intestinal tract. Animals that are, are carnivores have a short intestinal tract and they have canine teeth to tear flesh. So once you begin to yeah. understand the structure of the body and you eat the foods that your body was designed to process, you will begin to have a, a healthier relationship with your physical well-being. Mm -hmm. I don't have to give up ribs, do I? Brother, look, <laughs> I've gotten to the point in my journey where you can eat whatever you want to eat, but just eat the best quality. The right. best quality. So stay away from the junk food. Stay away. If you are what you eat, if you are what you eat, then what are you when you eat junk food? You are junk. I mean, this is real. Whatever you eat affects you on a cellular level. And when you know that, and when you realize that your body is a temple of God. That's right. Right? Then you would not do anything in a temple, in a sacred environment. Right. So why would you subject your body to anything? So I am as, as careful about what I put into my body as I am when I go into a church, when I go into a mosque. It's a that's sacred a message, yep. and I treat it as such. Yeah, that, that's a good analogy. It says, um, uh, become aware, step eight, become aware of your mind-body relationship. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, um, uh, gosh, I'm thinking of the, 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 the phrase, it's a psycho... Psycho neuro, um, I, 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 I'm blanking on the term now, but there's a direct relationship between what you think and how your body responds. Let me give you an example. There's a story uh, about a woman who had just given birth and yeah. had an argument with her husband, uh, a, a very heated argument before he went to work. And the woman later in the day, as she was breastfeeding her child, hmm was reliving the argument in her mind. Now, when you become angry, uh, your mind, uh, the, the limbic system within your mind is where your fight or flight uh, uh, program resides. So whenever you are threatened, then your body has to respond to either fight to protect you or flee to protect you, right? It's automatic. 
And so this woman was reliving the argument that she had with her husband as she was breastfeeding her baby. And that fight or flight syndrome kicked in. And typically what happens is, is that there is a flood of adrenaline that gives you the strength to run fast or to fight hard. And that extra adrenaline was secreted within her body, went into her breast, went into her breast milk, into her child's body and killed her child. Wow. There are many cases like that that are documented. And so the, the, you know, one of the reasons why people pray before they eat is that there is power in the thought and the word, and that power affects anything that you put into your body. So if we understood that um, and, and, and began to practice this in our lives, we would see how powerful reality that is. And knowing how powerful that is gives you a leg up on thriving in a racist and white supremacist society. So there are things that we can do to level the playing field and actually give us a head start. And take ownership of our body is probably the most important thing that we could do. Yeah, well, I think you you put it beautifully when you said it's our temple. It is and absolutely you, no question. You you mentioned earlier um, melanin, and you, and you have a step nine here. Familiarize yourself with the mysteries of melanin. The mysteries of melanin. What are the mysteries of melanin? I was fortunate in the uh, late 1980s uh, to be a part of um, the melanin conferences, which was started in California by Wade Nobles, uh, A.C. Hilliard, John Henry Clark, Francis Cress Welsing, and a host of psychologists, psychiatrists. Dr. Richard King was a principal player, uh, historians, Naeem Akbar, and they held annual conferences on melanin uh, throughout the United States. We hosted two conferences here in Washington, D.C. at Howard University in 19, uh, 1988. And what I learned sitting at the feet of these brilliant scholars is that melanin is a, is a chemical within our body that is the major organizing molecule within the human body. We've been socialized in this environment to think that melanin is just that that, that molecule that gives our skin color, but melanin is in all of the major organs of your body. There are seven areas in, in your brain, in your spinal cord, in all of your major organs, there are these melanated cells. And because of the fact that people of African ancestry have enhanced levels of melanin in their body, uh, European physicians, scholars, and scientists don't share that information with the general public. Now, as, as a result of, of, of my cultivating relationship with these scholars and then sponsoring the conferences, I attracted the attention of some colleagues of mine who worked at the um, uh, National Science Foundation here in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. They attended the conferences, we cultivated a relationship and it just so happened that one of my friends was a librarian uh, that institution, the other guy was the head of security. He had the keys to that facility. And we would come in after hours and go through the library and just find that these white folk, National Science Foundation holds melanin conferences every single year. They're studying this, this chemical and seeing how they can artificially create it, uh, recreate it in the laboratory so that they can enhance themselves. And um, and so a, a, a melanin, melanin, Tony, is that is not entirely unique to African people, or is it entirely unique? No, to African everybody people? has melanin. Every living being has melanin in their body. Uh, it is the major organizing molecule within the body. Without melanin, you would die. People of African ancestry just happen to have more. And there was there was a brother who was part of this consortium, uh, Dr. Carol Barnes, who lives in Houston, Texas. He is a chemical engineer. And he brought to this conference his background, his chemical background on melanin. And what he has shown is that, for example, when you watch black athletes on the basketball court and you see brothers make the no-look pass 
-hmm. He said the reason why they're able to do that, the reason why they, they're able to move with, with these uh, remarkable, displaying this remarkable skill is because the melanin in their body acts like an antenna and it expands throughout their body, connects with other melanated um, teammates. And so they are communicating on a psychic level. They can make the no-look passes. They can make moves that others can't make because this, this vessel that we have is a gift from God. Yeah. And when we know how to utilize this vessel, we can amplify all of these gifts. Now, the other side of that, if we don't know the power of melanin, then that works against us. For example, melanin is an alkaloid. And as a result, melanin bonds to other alkaloids that we ingest. For example, heroin, cocaine, marijuana are all alkaloids, which means then when melanated people consume those drugs, we are going to get higher faster, stay and have a more intense high and have a more difficult time trying to kick those drugs because the alkaline nature of these drugs binds to the uh, alkaline in melanin. And so mm -hmm. as a result of, 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 of these lectures, there was uh, one of the outcomes from these melanin conferences was uh, a brother developed a melanin specific drug test because what was happening to a lot of brothers and sisters who were going for a job and then, you know, you have to pee in the, in, in the cup and take a drug test, right? And many African-Americans were showing up false positive because the drug, the, the test was reading the alkaline and the melanin in their urine. So this it actually was a, it was a white chemist who developed a melanin specific drug test, which mm. would filter out the melanin in the urine so that brothers and sisters would have a fair shot at, at getting a job. And so, uh, you know, this was a subject matter that African-American scholars brought to the forefront in the 1970s, 1980s. This is the subject matter that Dr. Frances Chris Wilson dedicated her life to. Mm -hmm. and, and still, because of the nature of the environment in which we live, they poo-poo all of this and say there's a pseudoscience and that it has no validity. But the time that I spent at the National Science Foundation going through their archives, I can tell you they are studying melanin and have been studying melanin uh, for, for decades. Yeah, wow. Um, brothers and sisters, um, Anthony Browder gives a talk at the Power Networking Conference and he also gives a class. Um, it, would worth, it would be worth the price of admission just to come to the class. Uh, we're, we're rounding the corner now. We're, we're on spirit. We've covered the mind. We've covered the body. We're now going to cover spirit in step 10. And step 10 says, learn to interpret religious imagery. Yes. Well, George, you, you referenced that a little earlier when you talked about the Black Bible. It's important that you see yourself as a reflection of divinity. And we have to understand how the concept of God has been stolen from African people, Europeanized, and then presented to us as our path to salvation. So to know that Africans were the first human beings on the planet to conceive of a concept of God. God is a concept that other, every culture on this planet has cultivated a relationship with. African people or people of color have always seen God in their image. Only conquered people and enslaved people have been socialized to see God, to see the creator in an image other than themselves. Mm, mm. And the ancient Egyptian Pharaoh who conceptualized one God was Akhenaten? Akhenaten, yes. Yeah, and I learned that from you, of course. <laughs> okay. and Akhenaten was the husband of Nefertiti. Nefertiti, yes, that's right. And Nefertiti, and, and, and the and the father, Nefertiti. and the father of King Tut. And the father of King Tut. That's right. There you go. All right, incredible. Um, step eleven: Learn to honor the memory of your ancestors. This is very, very powerful. Very important. Yes. And One of the ways. 
one of the ways that we have been, uh, our, our growth and development has been stymied by our oppressor is by them making us believe that to acknowledge your ancestors is paganism, is voodoo. There are no people on this planet who have succeeded as a people by separating themselves from their ancestors. Every free people know that you are here because of the sacrifices that have been made by people along your bloodline. Okay. And so it is your duty to remember them, to honor them. We're gonna do that um, next month in the United States of America with Mother's Day. We're gonna do it the following month with Father's Day. We do it with Memorial's Day. We do it with uh, the 4th of July. All of these holidays or holy days were designed specifically to honor ancestors and African people of African ancestry have more ancestors than any other people on the planet. So we've got all of these souls right. waiting for us to call on them right. so that they can protect us, inspire us, inspire us, inspirit us, right? Inhabit us, protect us and allow us to do the work that needs to be done. Um, how many thousands of years of ancestors do we actually have? A lot, a, lot of people, a lot of black people can't wrap their mind around this. Okay, so let me share with you uh, information, data that comes from the Smithsonian Museum of, of, of Natural History, uh, in which they state, uh, and, and I'm, giving, I'm giving you the revised data. Um, Africans have been living on this planet for at least 300,000 years. 300,000 years. And humanity existed in Africa and Africa alone until about six, 6,000, no, 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 uh, until about 60 BC, when Africans began migrating out of Africa into the East and populating the rest of the world. Now, the other caveat is about four years ago, geneticists identified uh, the genes within Europeans that resulted in them losing their melanin. Because originally, if Africans are the first people on the planet, then Europeans are Africans who've lost their melanin, who've lost right. their, their, the, the, the phenotype and the hair structure and all of these things. But geneticists identified the genes within Europeans that mutated and became uh, white. And that gene is only seven to 8,000 years old. So if you take this data, what that means is that people of African ancestry have been living on this planet for at least 292,000 years before the Europeans. So why are we letting them call all the shots? Why are, they, why are we letting them determine what is our reality? And more importantly, why are we allowing them to, for, to, to, uh, to make us believe in a God concept that is, that is not a reflection of our own selves. Mm -hmm. the, the first great civilizations built in Africa, the, what, 7,000 years before Christ? Uh, at the least 7,000. Things that still stand today. Yeah, right. and those civilizations, while, while Egypt is the focal point, Egypt is nothing but the daughter of Ethiopia. Yes. Uh, culture began in Ethiopia and migrated northward down the Nile. So um, Chancellor Williams in his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization refers to um, Egypt as Ethiopia's oldest daughter. So we need context in order to really understand our story, our great and mighty walk as John Henry Clark called it. That's right. You, you said something that always gets, uh, gets me when I go to uh, uh, Egypt, that we were, we were floating or on a, we were on a Nile cruise and we were going down the Nile. Yes. Um, now this is an entirely different concept than what we know of in America. Um, if you were to look at this on a map, uh, we would actually be going north, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really up south, down north, exactly. right? I mean, right. So uh, it's 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 very unusual. It's not what you think when you, you say you're on a cruise going down the Nile. You're not going south, really, in many respects, right? Right. right. And, it's, um, and I guess that's because of the topography of the land, correct? Right. The higher elevation is in right. the south, in Ethiopia, 
which is All the right. source of the blue now. And water follows gravity and flows downhill. That's right. So, That's so right. the other reality is going back to the to the point I made earlier, step three regarding the mind, perception precedes being. You are who you believe you are. The only reason why we say down south and up north is because of a Flemish cartographer uh, who who created the Mercator map, the map that we use in every classroom. That was a map designed by a European specifically to favor Europe. So he put Europe at the top of the world and everybody else at the bottom. So when you create your own maps, you create your, you create your own reality. So if you sure. one, of the, one of the beautiful things that Asa used to do is to take a, a map of Africa or uh, he had a pen of Africa and he would turn it right side up and people would come to him and say, oh, your map is upside down. And then he would tell them about the difference between up south and down north. Right, 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 right. Uh, step 12, we're, we've got two more steps. Learn to prepare yourself for war and peace. Right. Step 12, uh, the Bible strategy. I, I referenced in, in, in this particular chapter, uh, the writings of Sun Tzu, a great Chinese philosopher. Yeah. And he gives strategies for war, how to prepare yourself for war. And the final step in preparing yourself uh, for war is to not have to fight a war, is to be so perfectly badass that your enemy knows better than to attack you because he would lose too much. And he, would, he then chooses to attack someone who is less prepared for battle. So in, in preparing for battle, you have to deal with your mind, your body, your soul, and, and you don't wait until you're on the battlefield to prepare your weapon, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, the best battle is a battle that is not fought. To use your mind and use other resources to preserve yourself, to preserve- Critical thinking, yeah, critical thinking. Absolutely. Critical thinking driven by intellectual curiosity. COVID-19, it, it says here, and I just had that as a note to myself, step 13, learn how to live in a new America. Absolutely. Unpack that. Well, um, the world has changed. And just like 9-11, we are never going back to that old world. It's a new frontier. And there's a lot of information and misinformation on the internet about COVID-19 and, and, and 5G, just, just a lot of confusing information. And what we have to begin to understand is the importance of, of taking control over the information uh, from the media that we allow into our mind into our body and we have to understand the power of fear fear shuts down your system fear makes you more susceptible to to flus to covid-19 to heart attacks to stroke we need to understand the importance of of living in a state of peace living in a state of fearlessness and yes. that's what covid-19 that's the new landscape that is being sculpted right now um, this virus is here, but other viruses have been here too. Sure. And if you are healthy, if you have a healthy immune uh, system, then right. the likelihood of you being adversely impacted by the COVID virus, COVID-19, or COVID-20, or COVID-21, 22, 23, 24, because they're coming. They're coming. They are coming. It's unavoidable because of the nature of the world in which we live and the fact that people are traveling all over the world and, and taking diseases places that they've never been before. Mm -hmm. What I know is that if you bulk up your immune system and there are specific things that you can do to minimize infection from COVID-19 or any other disease. And I was talking with a good friend of mine, uh, Charles French last Sunday who's a physician, just retired. Uh, he does um, did emergency room uh, medicine. And in our conversation, he, he shared with me that he had, he had uh, caught the, the virus and then mm. self-medicated. He knew better. He knew what would happen to him if he went to the hospital. <laughs> so he stayed at home. He drank plenty of fluids. Uh, there, there are specific things that you can do and, and simple things that you can do. Like, yeah. like if, let me share, just share this with your audience. Every morning when you arise, you should have a, a, a cup of hot water with the juice of a freshly squeezed lemon 
and a little bit of cayenne powder. You should drink that every morning. And what that does, the lemon uh, helps to turn your, your, your system um, uh, alkaline, from acid to alkaline. And viruses, diseases cannot live in an alkaline environment. Sugar is one of the worst products that you could ever put into your body because sugar is acidic and it destroys your cells. So there are specific things that we can do to take ownership of our bodies, ownership of our health, and mitigate the possibility of us becoming ill by diseases that are out here or will be out here in the future. Are there any healthy sugars? Or well, any processed sugar is bad, but is there any healthy? Like, uh, well, you know, consider this about sugar. Uh, healthy sugars are, are molasses, uh, maple syrup, honey, brown sugar. So we have to ask ourselves the question, going back to uh, step one, racism and white supremacy are the most persistent problems confronting us in America. Why is sugar white? Sugar is not naturally white. Right. Why is wheat white? Wheat is not naturally white. Those products are white because to white people, white is a symbol of purity. Brown mm -hmm. is a symbol, the brown in wheat, the brown in sugar to them was unsightly. So they bleach sugar, they bleach flour to take the color out of it. And when they take the color out, they take all of the nutrition out of it. That's why they fortify it with vitamins and nutrition. Why go through that nonsense? Eat things in as natural a state as, as possible, and that will be healthy for you. The other issue regarding sugar, uh, George, is that uh, since the 1970s, sugar has been cast aside and been re replaced by high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup is worse to your body than heroin. You know, the molecule in, in high fructose corn syrup is 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 almost identical to the molecule for heroin. There is, there is one difference in the molecular structure of those two drugs. Sugar is a drug. Yeah. They say sugar is the biggest addiction in America. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's in everything. It's in everything. Brothers and sisters, um, what you heard tonight is but an hors d'oeuvre from this master. Um, we are privileged to have him every year to kick off our conference with a special lecture to remind us who we really are. Please join us at the Power Networking Conference July 8th through the 11th. Meet Tony Browder live and in living color. Learn from him. Sit at the feet of a master. Bring your children uh, and it will be time well spent. Uh, I want to close tonight a, thanking Tony for these incredible survival strategies. Get the book and unpack. There's a lot more to unpack. We only had a, minute, a limited amount of time tonight, but um, you've got some highlights uh, on, on those survival strategies. Uh, join us again uh, July 8th through the 11th in Houston, Texas for our 19th anniversary of the Power Networking Conference, uh, a conference at Forbes magazine named one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed. Uh, the last two uh, celebrity guests, all-star guests, I did not make an offer, um, but I'd like to pick up on an offer for you uh, this evening. Um, so what we're going to do is help you understand that uh, in addition to Tony Browder being uh, one of our superstars who will be speaking, uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins, who will be joining us uh, this year, and uh, the one and only, uh, most of you have probably not met and maybe don't even know about, is Dr. Julius Garvey. Mm. Dr. Julius Garvey is the son of Marcus Garvey, and he's in his 80s with an, an incredible mind, and he will be joining us because we will be establishing the International Marcus Garvey Award uh, for our conference. And we have invited Dr. Garvey to be interviewed and to receive that first International Marcus Garvey Award because apples don't fall too far from the tree. A fascinating uh, gentleman. 
Uh, we spent two weeks together on a small tour in Africa, uh, oh, in November, and uh, you'll enjoy him. Um, so he'll be with us as well. The conference for an adult, the price of uh, admission for an adult is $1,495 or $1,500 if you met one person that could help change the, the trajectory of your life, would that be worth $1,500? The answer would be held to the yes, it would be worth it. No question about it. You'll meet more than one. We encourage black people when they conference where humanly possible, bring a young person, bring a student so they too can sit at the feet of masters. The young people that come to our conference, their lives are changed, I promise you that. A student registration is $800. So if you add $800 to a student registration, $1,500 to an adult registration, that's $2,300. So we have our Anthony Browder special, right? It's good until midnight. After midnight, don't call me. I will even deny that he was on the uh, All Star podcast. <laughs> I won't know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, George, you're cold. Dreaming. You were dreaming. I didn't know you, you made this up, but anyway. So we're going to reduce the 2300 student and adult package to $399. $399. This is what the conference flyer looks like. You can find out more details on powernetworkingconference.com. That's powernetworkingconference.com. Now, when you go there, you cannot get that deal on our website. So here's how you got to do it. And it's a limited time and a limited number of people. Because it's such a crazy offer, we are only limiting it to 10 people. The first 10. Now, when you email me, because that's how you're going to do it, you will just simply email me gfraser at frasernet.com. That's gfraser at frasernet.com. Say I'm in, put your cell number and your full name and email it to me. The first 10, and it'll be timestamped, um, will get a call from me and we'll handle our business. So that's our conference. That's a $1,900 discount because you were smart enough to sit at the feet of a master tonight, get a little something, something. But remember, it was just an hors d'oeuvre, right? You come to the conference, uh, you will have a buffet and a full meal from this master, I promise you. So if you're interested, G Fraser, F R A S E R, at FraserNet.com. I'm in. Your name and your cell number. Brother Bedford. Any closing thoughts, any closing remarks, anything you want to say? Are there any questions that anybody wants to ask? Well, George, first, I mean, I'm still here taking notes. You know, this is one of those humbling moments where when you think you know something, you realize you really don't know anything because Anthony Browder just expanded my thinking in so many different ways. So I was taking copious notes and we hope and pray that those who are watching are, you're taking notes as well. Come back and study this video as often as possible. We also want you to go to newblackpower.com to make sure you get the notifications about all of the upcoming uh, Power Podcast live stream series that we have. We've already had Lisa Nichols, Les Brown, Dr. Boyce Watkins, and then tonight we had the one and only Anthony Browder. And then this Tuesday coming up, we have Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. And so we want you to continue to share want you to continue to invite your family and friends to get this vital information. We have people who are watching this live stream from Paris, from Africa, all over the United States. Everyone is saying, hey, we had somebody in here say they didn't think George cussed when George said, you know, you need your ass kicked. So they said George cuss, you know, so they know now that George does cuss every now and then. So we just had a tremendous response. Again, what I would like for you to do, Anthony Brown, is give your website one more time so that people can go and get all of the information, your books from you. It can you give that website one more time and, and we'll make sure that we put that in the comment section for everyone. Fantastic. Thank you, Bedford. It's uh, ikg-info.com. You'll also find, in addition to our books and DVDs, you'll also find a link that will take you to the ASA Restoration Project so that you can see what we've done excavating and restoring tombs in Egypt for the past 12 years. 
Awesome, awesome. So George, I, I mean, I know we're at the time. There's probably a few questions. Do you want to take one or two questions? Do we want to put questions out there or should we uh, so shut it down? We have kept him over the time that we promised him. So it's entirely his decision. George, have a I question? love spending time with you. Let's, let's take some questions. Okay, I'll tell you what, here's what we're gonna do. We have enough time, we'll take two questions. So go ahead and put your questions in the comment section right now. And I'll take the first two questions and I'll forward them to George and Anthony Browder for you. So we wanna make sure, uh, again, they're saying I'm from Chicago, DC is in the house. Some said they can't wait to come and study with you. They can't wait to go to Luxor. Let me see if we can get one or two questions in real quick. We do have a question. I guess this is related to when you were talking about the sugar and they wanted to know is agave healthy? Agave is healthy, yes. And the beautiful thing about agave is that you only need a small amount. It's one of the most, it's one of the sweetest products out here. And it's, it's a natural alternative to sugar and excellent for people who have diabetes. And the African-Americans have the highest incidence of diabetes in the world. We call it the sugar. <laughs> We call it the sugar. I have I have diabetes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, well, I need to talk to you about some natural things that you could do to yes. minimize diabetes and 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 to avoid insulin. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that's a great answer. Now we have several that came in at the same time. So I'm just going to take the first one. And this one, we'll, what we'll do is put this one to uh, George and Anthony, Dr. Frazier and Anthony Browder. Uh, and let them deal with this because this probably needs some unpacking. It says, what are your top three expectations for the rest of the year? Hmm. George? Me? I defer to my elder first. Oh, my top three expectations for the year? Oh, my top three expert expectations for the year is I expect that this conference will happen July 8th through the 11th. That's that's, I, I really, really wanted to, now, if we don't know, God's in charge, if we have to move it, we'll move it. Right now, the NAACP is not moving their conference, which is a week after hours. The Urban League isn't moving their conference, which is uh, two weeks after hours. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus hasn't postponed their conference, which is in mid-September. So I've got my fingers crossed, and I expect that God will be on our side and that we can come together because once we are released from, um, you know, our uh, embargoed uh, stay-at-home selves, uh, we are, we are going to want to be with each other because Black people miss each other. So we're going to want some place to go where we can gather and love on each other and learn from each other. So I'm hoping that that will be uh, July 8th through the 11th. If not, it will let you know, but it will be in 2020. Um, so that's my number one expectation. That's what I'm focused on and, and getting out of jail card, right? <laughs> uh, and I had 28 speeches, uh, Tony, uh, mm -hmm. postponed uh, yeah. to the second half of the year from February through May. Um, they were postponed. They were not canceled. So I'm hoping uh, to get on my horse. Uh, it's called an airplane and get back on the road and go out and talk. And this is just what I love. So that those are my top two expectations of me and begin planning for 2021. 20, uh, As you know, we have our trip together in March uh, with Tony Browder, an incredible trip. If you'd like to know more about that, just um, you can email me and say, you know, let me know about uh, uh, I can send you a flyer on the, uh, the Egypt trip coming up next March. Yeah, George, go, George, can you give a little detail about that? Because we did have a couple people asking how can they go to Egypt with Anthony. Uh, so I, I think you probably should expound on that a little bit more. Right, Anthony, myself, and Dr. Quad David Whitaker could do a tour, but Anthony does tours himself as well. He does individual tours with his own groups uh, and his own followers. Uh, and how often do you do those, Anthony? Well, typically uh, we go uh, during the summer in July once a year, and then we have our, our excavation missions and I take people over for that. So we, we generally go twice a year. Right, yeah, twice a year. three times a year mm -hmm. yes yes and then um we go in let's it's the fall in in march uh, is march the fall right, yeah it's it's uh uh it's, it's either the 19th or the 20th of yes. march in 2021 yes. mm -hmm. yeah and and it's it's very nice the, the temperature is always beautiful it's not that 
desert heat yet. And that's why we picked that time of the year. Um, uh, it is, uh, we also have on our cruise a, uh, a five day, four night cruise down the aisle, uh, the, the Nile, five day, four night cruise down the aisle. So it's a, it's about a 12 day journey. Um, and uh, we go to Luxor, we go to Abu Simbel, and of course we spend quality time all over the Cairo area, looking at the various sites there. So it's an incredible, but most importantly, it's really like a study tour and their lectures uh, um, at night with Anthony Browder. So you imagine looking at these incredible historical iconic monuments and then learning at the feet of Tony Browder in a beautiful, small, intimate um, lecture series that we have each night. Uh, it's something very, very different. So if you've never been to Egypt, it, A, it needs to be on your bucket list. Um, but if you can get there with us uh, next March, again, just email me and just put uh, on your email Egypt and I'll send you some information. Okay. We're already at um, uh, nine uh, I'm ins for the conference. So we only have one left. So if you're interested, you better get it in. Uh, so uh, this is rather quickly. Yeah, rather quickly, Anthony, you want to go through your top three real quick and then we'll kind of wrap it up. Okay, sure. Um, I had spent um, 15 years doing training at the uh, Children's Defense Fund for their national training for about 1,500 college students. And they're based at the Alex Haley Farm in Clinton, Tennessee. And I've spent time in Alex Haley's former home. And in his house, he has a sign above the door which says, find the good and praise it. Find the good and praise it. So as I look at this COVID-19 pandemic, we have to find the good within this terrible um, disease right now. And, and the only good that I can see that's coming out of it is that it's forcing us to be still. Mm. It's forcing us to spend more time with ourselves mm -hmm. and our loved ones. Mm -hmm. It's giving us time to read. It's giving us time to study and to evaluate because this thing is, is, is taking people out all over the places. I know at least four people who have it. Um, and and mm. so it's, it's helping us become more introspective. And so out of this pandemic, out of this lockdown, hopefully there will come a greater desire on the part of Black people to love each other more, mm -hmm. to come closer together with your families, and to work together for our collective uh, benefit and prosperity. If we can do those three things, I would be a happy man. That's awesome. Amen and hallelujah. A amen. So I, well, I it's think been a full night. Yeah, and I think he answered pretty much any of the other follow-up questions about dealing with you. So thank you again. Again, everyone, if you like this, again, go to newblackpower.com to get on a notification. We have Dr. Dennis Kimbrough coming up this Tuesday. And then again, give your website one more time, uh, Brother Anthony, so that they can have it on the top of mind. Yes, it's ikg-info.com. Okay, and I'm sure it's in the comments section. We'll make sure it is there. Uh, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed yourself as I thoroughly enjoyed myself. If you want more of this, if you want to ask questions, let us know. Let George know. Put it in the comments, and we'll try to our best to serve you. We're all at home. We want to help you. We want to make sure that we share the love. Everything that Anthony just shared with us about the expectations that he has, I think we all want that coming together educating each other and learning from each other. And I think we'll come out of this a lot stronger, better and more powerful, just the way that he said. So I think that's it, George. I mean, we yep. had a full one house tonight. One, co one co closing thought. Sure. The purpose of life <clears throat> is simple. It is to love, to give, to serve, and to add the highest value to somebody or something each and every day. We've heard from a man tonight who is the epitome of the purpose of life. Good night, everybody. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Brother Anthony. All right, you're welcome. Be in peace. Be safe. Thank you.